forgive them that were there as well as us today. That forgiveness on the cross was just not there for the people that were at that place at the foot of the cross. That was there for our salvation as well. We've been forgiven by Christ. The next one, the second word is, today you shall be with me in paradise as he stands there between two thieves and one of them looks his way and says, Jesus, will you come? Uh, Jesus, will you remember me? And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, this thief on the cross had nothing to lose. He had nowhere to go, no new appointments. So he figured he'd take his chance and say, can you take me? And Jesus said, no problem. It is done. Today you shall be with me in paradise. Word number three, woman, behold thy son. Behold thy mother. We see that before he left, he knew that the most prized possession that he had in this world was his mother. He wanted to make sure that he had her taken care of. And he looked down and he told the beloved disciple to take care of her. He said, woman, behold thy son. He was not being disrespectful when he called her woman. You see, woman was a term that was used by the Hebrews as a term of no giving honor and respect to his mother. And that's what he did. He respected honor, and he took care of his mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that Hebrew 13 says that God would never leave us or forsake us. Neither would he leave the son, his own son. He needed to make sure that the prophecies were fulfilled that we hear about in Psalm 22. And then he said, I thirst. What was he thirsting? Was he really thirsty? You see, the first time they asked him if he wanted some, some uh, vinegar, and he didn't want it. Why? Because he wanted to feel every single, every single thing that was happening to him on that cross. So when he said, I thirst, it's because it was a deeper thing that he was just saying. He said, now by thirsting, I'm finished. I'm finished. And it says in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 2, 9, but we see that Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. He was thirsting to get this, this plan of salvation so that we could all be, uh, have the living life. Amen? And so he said, it is finished. What was finished? Everything on the cross was finished. Salvation was finished. All the prophecies that had been spoken had been finished. Everything that he did for us, that we would be saved, the plan of salvation, the promises, the prophecies, the sacrifices, the ceremonies that the priest had done are all finished. His perfect obedience was finished. Then he bows his head and says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We know that Jesus gave his life for us, not because it was taken away from him, but because it was he was freely giving it. He says in John 10, I laid my, down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it back up. You know, the world became dark that night. It was really dark. It was Friday. But today is Sunday. Woo! Hallelujah! <laughs> Mike, Bill, put your mic on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, they were nailing him to the cross on Friday, but... Sunday was coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen. It brings joy to my heart to see all your faces here this morning. I love it when the house of the Lord is just filled with praising people. It's just an awesome day today. And uh, Resurrection Day is one of the most, actually, it's the most important day of Christianity. Without the risen Christ, there is no Christianity. Amen. And so today is a day that we come together to hear about the great resurrection and the significance of that, and today is no different. I want to share about the meaning of Resurrection Day, as some could call it Easter. Uh, however, history shows that Easter is actually a, a pagan holiday. Uh, that's why we call it Resurrection Sunday. But it's a day of celebration. Families coming together to fellowship, to cook, to eat, have large meals, 
bring their children to the mall to take pictures with the bunny. Hey, listen, I don't have any problems with the bunny as long as he's saved, okay? A born-again, God-fearing bunny is okay with me. Hallelujah. However, today is not about the Easter bunny. Today is not about traditions. Today is about a resurrection, a holy day of Christianity. Amen? Hallelujah. And so this morning, the title of my message is Five Resurrections. Five Resurrections. And my key verse is from 1 Peter 1.3, which says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, my, as you can tell, as my title suggests, uh, I know this morning you were coming to probably hear about one resurrection. But actually, I'm going to talk about five resurrections. You're like, five resurrections? That's right. Amen. You know, there's no other time of year I can preach about resurrections than on Resurrection Day. And so you guys get five for the price of one. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so the resurrections I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about biblical resurrections. I'm going to talk about non-biblical resurrections. I'm going to talk about the glorious resurrection. And then I'm going to talk about resurrection number one and resurrection number two. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's get started with the resurrection. Uh, we're going to start with uh, resurrection uh, the, from the, from the uh, biblical side. The biblical resurrections, these are individuals that died and were raised from the dead. Amen? In the Old Testament, we have actually three that were, that were raised from the dead. Not as many as the New Testament. There's many more in the New Testament. But the Old Testament, we had three. And these three were raised by two prophets. One was by Elijah, that was his name, and the other one was uh, from Elisha. Two different people, two different names, two different times. The one, Elijah, he, he resurrected, he, he resu uh, excuse me, Elijah uh, had resurrected, resurrected a uh, woman from, uh, uh, wait, let's see, I just lost my place here. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Elijah raised a dead boy from a woman who lived in Zarephath. I was trying to figure out that. There it was, Zarephath. I forgot the name of the place, Zarephath. Elijah raised a widow's son from Zarephath who died from an illness. Now, Elisha raised a Shumanite woman who died of, the same, of an illness as well, much different time, much later date, but raised, raised this child as well. Now, Elisha, he's the second prophet that raised another person from life. But I want to explain something here. Elisha was someone who had a double anointing. Elijah had a, an anointing, but Elisha had a double anointing. And so one day they were burying this dead body, and they threw it after Elisha had died. They threw this body into his grave. And as soon as his body hit Elisha's body, it literally sprang to life. The Bible says came up on his feet and was alive. Talk about second chances. Hallelujah. So that is the end of the three that are in the Old Testament. Now we come into the New Testament, and the first resurrection to be performed is by who do you think? Jesus, of course, Jesus. And the way he did it I thought was so cool, because here's this funeral procession coming into this town called Nains, and Jesus knows that the, the widow uh, just lost her son. So she doesn't have a husband, she just lost her only son, and Jesus had compassion on it. So what he does is he goes and he literally stops the funeral procession. He's like, all the guys, I got something to do over here, stop. He walks over to the coffin, he looks inside the coffin, and he says, young man, get up. And he did. He got up. All he had to do was speak the words, and the man rose up. Hallelujah. Another time, Jesus was in this place, with, uh, in, uh, he was in this big crowd, and this guy comes running up to him. He was a leader at this synagogue. Uh, his name was Jarius. And so Jarius has this daughter that's sick, and he's trying to get Jesus' attention because the daughter is, you know, very sick, and she ends up dying. So Jesus goes to the house with Jarius. He gets there. There's a crowd of people there. He says, oh, she's just sleeping. They're mocking him, you know. He goes into the room. He takes in Peter, John, and James, you know, that's his inner circle, and he takes the parents, and he goes up to the little child, and he says, child, get up, and the child gets up. Just speaks. I love how Jesus just walks in, speaks the name, and, that, and, and, the, and, the, and they rise up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But Jesus isn't the only one that does resurrections either. There was also this other guy named, there was also Peter. You remember, everybody knows who Peter is. Well, Peter goes in, and, she, and there's this woman, Tabitha is her name. And Tabitha is a really cool, you know, nice lady. She's always uh, making things for the widows and very popular with the widows. And she gets sick and she dies. Well, when she dies, all of the widows were very sad. And so they called Peter. He was only in the next town over. And so they called Peter over, and they, you know, they explained to him what happened. So he goes up into the upper room where she's laying, 
she's laying down. She walks into, he walks into the room. He prays. Peter gets down and he prays. And then he turns to the woman and says, Tabitha, get up. And she gets up. Hallelujah. Praise God. We have the power. That was Peter. We have the power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then Paul. Now, here's one of my favorite stories. Paul is preaching. And I mean, he's preaching good. He's preaching real good. He's preaching so, he's, he's getting ready to leave the next day because he has a mission trip that he's got to go on. So Peter gets up there and he's, he's in the house, with, he's in this place with all of these people. Place is packed. I mean, the house is packed, kind of like today, right? Just packed from the pulpits to the pews. There was just people all over. And so he's preaching to them. And all of a sudden, there's this guy that's sitting up on the, on the third floor there. They're up on the third floor. He's sitting on the window. And all of a sudden, he falls asleep in the middle of Peter's preaching. Now, this is okay, granted. Peter started preaching about uh, sometime early in the morning, and he went, the word says, till the next day. So he preached a long time. I promise we won't preach that long. But he preached a long time in about, oh, I'd say probably around 11 or 12 o'clock at night. This guy gets tired, and he falls asleep in the window. But worse than that, he falls out of the window. Hits the ground and dies. I mean, can you imagine? He probably had broken bones, uh, busted spleen, probably punctured lungs. I mean, uh, three, three stories is a, is a long way to fall. But he was definitely dead. And so Paul's like, probably just like, oh, I can't believe this is going to happen right now. There's always the enemy. He's always trying to mess up my, my message. He runs down the stairs, jumps on top of the guy, and I don't know what he prayed. But whatever it is, it was probably something like, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I command his soul to come back right now so I can finish this message. And boom, he pops up. And he goes upstairs up before him, and the guy actually walks up the stairs and goes to get something to eat. So obviously, whatever broken bones he must have had, whatever punctured lung spring, whatever he had done to him, was obviously healed when he, when he rose up. Hallelujah. Praise God. When Jesus raises you from the dead, he heals you of all things. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then, of course, we have Lazarus. Lazarus is the most famous one. Everybody knows about it. But this is the most impressive, the most impressive resurrection. Why? Well, first of all, all of these other resurrections that were done, they were all for people that were only dead for a short time, not really a long time. Not that it matters. If you're dead, you're dead. But with Lazarus, he was dead for four days. Imagine that. Four days he was dead. And Jesus says to his disciples, you know, that Lazarus, you know, he's sick and he's, he's sleeping. They didn't understand sleeping. He meant he's dead. And finally, he had to tell him. He said, okay, he's dead. We got to go and, and wake him up. And so, uh, but he tells his disciples something that's very interesting. He says, to them in, uh, in, he says to them in John 11, 4, he says, Jesus said that this sickness, this sickness will, he will, that will not result in death. This sickness will not result in death because this sickness was for so that God would be glorified so that he could glorify the Son. This was a very important resurrection. Let me tell you, when God raises people from the dead, he does it for a reason. There's always, he doesn't do it just to do it. He does it because he has a plan in mind for everyone. There's a reason why somebody died, and there's a reason why God makes them, has them get resurrected. And Lazarus was no different. Lazarus was resurrected because you know what happened when he got resurrected? All of a sudden, Jesus became real popular. Everybody wanted to know who Jesus was. What? This guy was in the tomb. He was already buried. They had the stone rolled. And they go and this guy gets up. How in the world could that be possible? I want to go see this. Lazarus, he really alive. Are you telling me? No, you're pulling my leg. He can't be alive. No, I'm telling you, he's alive. We went to his funeral. He's not alive. No, he's alive. And they all came. I mean, all multitudes of people come. They wanted to see Lazarus alive. And the Pharisees were getting pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously they were pretty upset about it. And so they wanted to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus, because he proved that many believed on that day. But the point was God had a plan. And it was a plan that right after that, not too much longer after that, that we had the, the, the set, that Sunday of uh, beginning of Resurrection Week, that holy week that started. All these people came together because of Lazarus, Lazarus who was risen. Amen. God always has a plan. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so then we have the saints that are resurrected. Now, I'm going to talk about them, but I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. Right now, uh, we're done with the biblical resurrections, and I want to talk about the non-biblical resurrections. These are people raised from the dead today, people that have been raised after the fact. These are, uh, this, people will say sometimes, you know, no, it's impossible to raise people from the dead. There's a lot of people that just don't believe it. You can talk to them until you're blue in the face. They're just not going to believe that people can be resurrected. Even some preachers are not convinced about that. Oh, well, when, you know, the apostles had died, you know, that all went with them. And that's not true. That is not true. And I'm going to tell you why. Because what you're doing is you're telling Jesus is a liar. And Jesus is not a liar. Can people, can people genuinely be raised from the dead? A lot of people say no, but yes. Jesus said nothing is impossible with God. 
That means nothing. Well, except for raising the dead. You can't do that. No, nothing is impossible from God. Jesus said when he, when he goes back to the Father, he would send us the Holy Ghost. And he did. He sent us the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said we would do works like he did. We would do the same works that he did. Even greater works. Even greater works. Well, if Jesus raised him from the dead, then I guess that means that's part of it, doesn't it? I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just call a spade a spade. That's what it is. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, whatever you pray for in his name, I will do it. I will do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did Jesus heal the sick? Did Jesus open the eyes of the blind? Did Jesus cast out demons? Did Jesus raise the dead? Yes, he did. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying to go down to the next funeral and, get, and raise somebody from the dead. That's all. Everything is done in God's will, in God's timing, whatever we do. Amen. Amen. So non-biblical resurrections, uh, you don't find those in the Bible, but you find those in today. That's what that's all about. Hallelujah. It happens in today's time. But I want to show you uh, two very short clips that I think are very interesting. If we could just play those clips, I promise it's not long. It's two clips, but they're five minutes total. I think three minutes for one and two minutes for the other. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't tell me God can't do it. Don't tell me God can't do it. I love that song. Hallelujah. But I just wanted, that's all I'm going to say on this. Uh, I just wanted to bring that to, uh, I thought that was very interesting. Um, speaking of the giver of life, I want to speak on the third type of resurrection. And that, of course, is the glorious resurrection. But I'm going to speak to you on this in a different way. Because one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that when Jesus, was ra when Jesus raised from the dead, there are so many people that will deny that Jesus even rose from the dead. Then there are those that say that his body was stolen. They come with all kinds of excuses, and we've heard them all, and we've seen all that the prophecy had been fulfilled. But there's one, one detail that a lot of people miss that I'm going to really drive home this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. And it comes from, our, uh, it comes from a passage of Scripture that uh, you can find in John 20, verses 1 through 9. And I love this passage of Scripture because there's so much here that people just kind of glance over when they read through it. So I'm going to start off uh, as I go through this, and I'm going to kind of take breaks as I go through it to explain some things, all right? Hallelujah. So early on the first day of the week... While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Okay. First of all, she didn't even, it doesn't even show that she looked into the tomb at that point. That was later. But she looked, she didn't even look. She ran immediately back to tell Peter and John. That's what she did, okay? So she, she even, she didn't even, she went back to tell Peter and John. Okay, even though Jesus said to them, that he's going to die and he's going to be raised on the third day. I don't know how much simpler I can get than that, but they knew this. And he told them that over and over again, that they're gonna be, he's going to be handed over to man, he's going to die, and he's going to raise on the third day. And that's what he told them. So why did she look at the open tomb and say, oh my gosh, somebody stole the body. Somebody took the body out of there, and she went right back. The reason why she said that is because, you see, as of yet, they still did not understand Jesus had to raise from the dead even though they were told, okay? Praise God. Verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. The other disciple is John. John always referred to himself as the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. He says, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. All right. Now, Peter and John are running to the tomb. Peter goes first, but John comes second, but John is faster than Peter. He's younger than him, and so he beats him to the tomb. And so as they're running, I can only imagine what's going through their mind. How can this possibly be? How can somebody take his body? I know what it is. It's the Roman soldiers. They're up to no good. They probably, they had enough power to be able to move that one-ton stone. I'm sure that they probably moved it, and they took his body out, and I'm sure the Pharisees have something to do with it. I'm sure this whole religious community is pulling him and putting him somewhere so they make sure that his body doesn't get out of there, you know, because we told him he would or whatever. But you see, they didn't know that because the Scripture says in, in 9, it says... They didn't, they didn't yet not understand the scripture that he was supposed to raise from the dead, even though they told it to him, and Jesus told it to him over and over and over again. 
verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, that's John again, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, verse 5, and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Why didn't he go in? There's the first question you got to ask yourself. John's there first. He can just go right in, but he, he's staring. He's, he's, he's just looking. What is he looking at? What is, what is God John so intrigued? Hmm. Verse 6. Then Simon Peter comes along behind him, and he goes straight into the tomb. That's what you would expect. You know, if you, the tomb door is open, you're going to run right in. Well, that's Peter. I mean, you know, the guy's walking on water. He's always doing everything, right? He, he wanted to be the first one in there. He was the first one in. So he gets in there, but Peter notices something. He not only is looking at the, at the, at the linen cloths, he's looking at something else. In verse 6, he says, Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there. He noticed that too, okay? As well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen, meaning that the headpiece was somewhere else. But look at what he said. The linen cloth is still there, meaning it's still in the exact spot that Jesus was laying in, as if nobody touched it. There was no linen cloth strewn all over the place. It wasn't unwrapped. It can't be unwrapped anyway. It's kind of like, you know, when you do paper mache, how, you know, you, you wrap it and it, it like kind of holds its shape, you know what I mean, and it stays in it. That's, that's what he's talking about because when they embalm with the, you know, with the, the hundred pounds of uh, spices that, that Nicodemus brought, you know, they soak all of the cloth. That's how they bury the body. They go all the way up to the neck. And, 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 they, and they put this liquid on, you know, there's these spices and everything to prepare the body for burial. And then they do the same thing with the napkin. You know, it's a napkin that they put on the head. That they, it's a four-corner, you know, handkerchief, napkin, depending on which version you read. But I want to bring something to your, to, uh, to your remembrance here. John 27, this very same verse, okay, says this. And the napkin that was about his head, not laying with the linen cloths, okay, but wrapped together in place by itself, wrapped together. Do you know what that means? Exactly what I was talking about with the paper mache thing. In other words, wrapped together is just, uh, some, some say folded together, some say twisted together, some say rolled up together. But in the Hebrew or the Greek, when you're, when you're reading that, what that means is that it's still together. It's not pulled apart, it's not cut, it's not unraveled. It's still in the same, it's still in the same. Are you starting to get the picture of what's going on here? What it means is that the wrappings were still intact. The only difference is there's no body in it. How did they get the body out? How did they get the body out? That's what I'd like to know. And that is why when John comes in at verse 8 and says this, because now John finally enters the tomb, finally the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. And you know what he said? He saw and believed. He saw and believed what? He saw and believed that Jesus rose from the dead because there's no way his body could have evaporated out of those linen cloths. There's no possible way. The only explanation is Jesus rose from the grave as he said. Think about that. He believed, and Peter did too. He saw that. He was looking at that like, wait a minute, what's going on here? These things, and then it comes to their remembrance. Wait a minute. You see, when verse 9 says, they still did not understand the scripture that Jesus had the raise from the dead. Now they remembered. That's why that verse is there. Because they forgot. That's right. Jesus told us he was going to raise from the dead. Duh! They finally get it. You see, they didn't understand it until it happened. They didn't think Jesus was going to get out of that grave. If they did, they would have had a party for him when he came out of the tomb. Instead, you know who greeted Jesus when he popped out of that tomb? A bunch of soldiers, a bunch of Roman soldiers that were there watching it to make sure nobody would go into it. I bet you that was a pretty, high, a, a, a pretty good experience for those people. Can you imagine the Roman soldiers seeing Jesus all of a sudden, the, the stone just being lifted out of the way? Because they didn't move it. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When you have your resurrected body like Jesus has now, you no longer are held to the laws of physics. You can be from here to there in a split second. 
You could be on the other side of those doors without even opening those doors. In fact, that was shown twice in John, where Jesus appeared to the disciples behind locked doors because they were so afraid of the, of the Pharisees and the Jewish people that they were going to be stoned or whatever. So they locked themselves into the room. To, they didn't leave, but they just locked themselves in there trying to figure out their next target, what they're going to do. I mean, eventually they just went back to their old ways, but, you know, their old fishing and, and stuff. But the point is, is that Jesus just appeared in front of them while they were behind locked doors, and he said, peace be with you, and he showed them this, the nail print hands and, and, this, and, the, and the spear uh, hole from the side, and they rejoiced. The Bible says they rejoiced. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so that's the first resurrection. I'm, that's the uh, glorious resurrection. So we spoke about the biblical resurrections, the non-biblical resurrections. We spoke about the glorious resurrection. And now we're going to talk about the first resurrection, because you know what? The first resurrection wasn't even available until Jesus did what he did. You see, all of those people that were raised from the dead, including Lazarus, they all had to die again. Oh, they were raised from the dead, but they weren't raised with their glorified bodies. Only Jesus, he was the first fruits to be able to raise from the dead with his glorified body. And because of that, hallelujah, we get a first resurrection. I'm going to tell you what the first resurrection is. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. One day very soon, Jesus is going to come to rapture his church and take them to heaven at the time that he will resurrect all the righteous who died in Christ. That resurrection, that very first one, is for us, the believers, the born-again believers who understand Holy Ghost-filled believers are going to go and meet him in the air. Those who are alive and those who are dead are going to rise up in Christ and meet him in the air. Oh, hallelujah, what a day that's going to be. So the first resurrection, as I said, is for the just. That's what it is. It's the resurrection of the just. And we're the just. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah, praise God. Oh, yes, Lord. That day is coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Revelation 26 says, blessed are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them and will reign with Christ for a thousand years. You see the second death. What is the second death? You say, well, that's the second resurrection. That's the one you don't want to be in. That's the one where you're going to be coming before the Lord in the great white, uh, the, 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 our Father God at the great white throne of judgment. If you're in that position, if you're in that, if you're in that, in that, at that judgment, it's not good. It's not good. The books will be opened. The book of life will be opened. And if your name is not in the book of life, which I can tell you is not, because you're at the, wait, you know, the great white throne of judgment, but you know people. No, 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 my, book, my name's in that book. Go, go look. Just go look. It's L-R. No. And, no, sorry. Not here. Not here. You don't want to be in that. The chart up here, if we could follow through up here. Yes, here we go. Hallelujah. Jesus will rapture us and, the resurrected, uh, and resurrect the dead in Christ. And that's the first resurrection. After the rapture happens, the first resurrection takes place. Then Jesus will come to this world and we will be with him, reigning with him for a thousand years. The second resurrection is for those who did not believe and do not have a relationship with Christ and died in their sins. That resurrection will not happen until a thousand years after we're ruling and reigning with Christ. Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Do you know that everything you do in life, everything is recorded? And guess what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's a lot of bad things in that book, unless, of course, you gave your heart to Christ. Because every one of those sins would be forgiven and wiped clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why Jesus did what he did. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. 
The lake of fire is the second death. That's the one that we were just talking about when you go up in the first resurrection, that the second death has no power over us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, that's a choice that we make. You either choose Jesus or you choose the world. You either choose God or you choose the devil. No matter how you look at it, there's only one choice you can make. You want to make it to heaven, you choose Jesus. And you're guaranteed you'll be making it to heaven. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. You know, a lot of people believe uh, not knowing what God tells us to believe. Many people think they're going to go to heaven. Oh, well, I believe. Well, that's what you believe. But what does the Bible believe? What does the Bible tell you? Because you know what? When it comes to what you believe in, this is the only thing God's going to go by. This is the only thing he's going to go by. Hallelujah. Jesus even said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, there are people sitting in the churches and, and, and they believe they're going to go to heaven, but yet they don't want anything to do with God. Oh yeah, well I go to church, I do this, I do that. I say praise and hallelujah. And Jesus says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles, and they will, and they have, and they do. But they have no relationship with Christ. They do it for fame. They do it for fortune. They do it for all the wrong reasons. God will use them. He'll use them. He'll use anybody. You could go up to them, not care about anything about the Lord, and pray the sinner's prayer over them, and you know what? They'll receive it. They'll, rec they'll receive salvation. That person will receive salvation that that unsaved person prayed for. Anyone whose name was not found in a book was thrown in the light of fire. So then I will tell them plainly. Jesus says, I will tell them plainly. I never knew you. No relationship. Away with you, evildoers, he calls them. Revelation 26, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. Hallelujah. Today you have the privilege of choosing your own resurrection. Jesus said, blessed and holy, the one who shares in the first resurrection. Only born again believers can achieve this. Not on your own, not by your own works, but by grace, by God. It's a gift of salvation it's a free gift, by the way, over the second death, which has no power. Hallelujah. So I've explained to you about the five resurrections, and now it's your choice. Which one do you want to fall into? Praise the Lord. If Jesus didn't go to the cross, we wouldn't have that first choice. The biblical one, well, you can't be found in that because that's gone already. That was in the ancient time, so you're not in that resurrection. So which one can you choose here? Well, the non-biblical one you have, is there anybody here raised from the dead recently? Okay. All right, so can that, that scratches you out of that. And besides, even if you were, you're still going to have to die to second death because that's not a resurrected body, right? Number three is the glorious resurrection. Well, only Jesus can claim that one. Nobody, unless you are perfect and have zero sin in your life and nobody does, because we're born into it, then you can't get into that one. So that only leaves us two choices. Two choices, the first resurrection or the second resurrection. Let's go back to my key verse. 1 Peter 3, 4, in the New King James Version. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, his mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Oh, praise the Lord through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. We all have an inheritance. We have an inheritance, an incorruptible inheritance, an undefiled inheritance, an incorruptible. It does not fade. We have an inheritance where the moss cannot decay. There is no decay in heaven. Everything, all of our inheritance, what is our inheritance? Our inheritance is our salvation. It's our life with Christ. Hallelujah. Our inheritance is being with Jesus for, our, for eternity. Amen. Eternity. Think of how long eternity is because there is no end. Oh, praise God. Or eternity in hell, and I know we don't want to choose that. And hear my heart. 
This is why I'm telling you what I'm telling you this morning. It's important, Resurrection Sunday. This is not just to say, oh great, Jesus raised from the dead, hallelujah. We need to know why he raised from the dead. He loved us that much. He loved us that much. If you need the power of the resurrection in your life, then I invite you to meet the resurrected king. Matthew 27, 50 through 54. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Remember I told you in the beginning that there was another resurrection of the saints? And I said, I'll tell you about that later. Well, this is where that comes in. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 52, 51. At that moment, the curtain of it, when Jesus gave up the ghost and he died, at that moment, the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus resurrected and went into the holy city and appeared, and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely has, was the, this was the Son of God. Not was, I say, surely this is the Son of God. When he cried, they thought that they got rid of him, but they didn't. And these people that were raised, they were raised from, they weren't dead that long. They were raised recently because they remembered the people. They went into the Holy Spirit and many people saw them. If they saw them, then they had to know them, right? Because it's saying that they saw these people that, wait a minute, Harry, where are you? He goes, yeah, I went down the street and had a bagel the other day. I was like, where, where, this, this guy's dead. How can he be going to have a bagel? I mean, <laughs> the, the guy's not even alive anymore. Well, how'd you get out here? No, it can't be you. All these people, no, you don't, you don't hear what happened? Oh my gosh, I just got raised from the dead. Yeah, Jesus raised from the dead and all these people went into the city. These people went into the city, not just a few people, a, a bunch of these people, got, they rose from the, their graves. And they walked out and they went into the holy city and they were speaking to the people and the people recognized them so they couldn't have been dead that long. Why? So that the resurrection story could go out. That's where it started. It's the saints that were, came out of the tombs. Now they all had to die again, okay, because they didn't get resurrected because that hasn't happened yet. The first resurrection is coming and it's coming soon. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. So he is no longer dead. He has risen and we got to rejoice about it. Your dead marriage, if you have a problem in your marriage, if you have issues going on in there, well, guess what? He can revive your marriage. He can resurrect your marriage. He can resurrect your dreams and your aspirations. He can resurrect you from everyday sin. He can resurrect your family from spiritual death. He can resurrect your spiritual own life. He can resurrect your past, your past mistakes, your past addictions, whatever it is that you did. He can resurrect everything that was done. He can resurrect the broken families. He can resurrect the broken relationships. He can resurrect your shame and guilt and kill it in the name of Jesus. He can resurrect your sickness and disease and kill it in the name of Jesus. Corinthians 15, 5, 5 and King James Version says, O oh, death, is, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Death could not hold him. The grave could not contain him. Hallelujah. I want to call the band back up here. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Oh, praise God. So I ask this morning, knowing who Jesus is, hallelujah, and knowing what he did for you, what option are you going to pick this morning? Is there anyone here that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Choose the first resurrection. Last week we had five people come up, hallelujah, gave their hearts to Jesus. Praise the Lord. And we're praying for more. We're praying for more. Our job is to reach out to the lost and say, there's a better world out there. You see this nonsense going on all around us? <laughs> well, you know what? There's a better life than that. Jesus provided it for us. He says, I go to a place to prepare for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I am coming back again. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Is there anyone here that wants to come up? You know, when Jesus put that, when, when, when Peter put that napkin, you know, the head piece that was found separate and was by itself, Jesus put that there for a reason. He didn't put it there just because, you know, he says, oh, this thing, I just got to, you know, get out. And, no, he did that on purpose. Because when they saw that, there's a tradition that is in, uh, in Jerusalem back in those days. And you know what that tradition is? Very simple. That napkin that was sitting on the side represented when the master and the servant get together 
uh, uh, prepares the dinner. The, the servant prepares the dinner for the master. And what happens is he prepares the table, the plates, the utensils, everything. And he goes over there and he says, you know what? When the, when the master is done with his meal, he takes the, the napkin and he crumbles it up and he throws it down. And you know what that means? That means the servant can now come and clean up that mess. But if the master takes that napkin and folds it up and puts it on the side of his plate, you know what that means? It means he's coming back. It means he's coming back. Jesus made a point. I'm coming back. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.